Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in to Europe's Achilles Heel, the Migration and Asylum Regime Unpacked. My name is Jana Hilhorst and I will be your host today. So in the last month, it has been all over the news. The overcrowded refugee camp Moria on the Greek island Lesbos caught fire. And as a consequence, thousands of refugees were left without shelter, access to food and healthcare. And of course, this is not the first time that Moria or any of the other refugee camps in Greece and Italy have been in the spotlight. Since the refugee crisis of 2015, the refugee camps on the Greek islands have become a symbol for what many people call Fortress Europe and the failing of the European migration and asylum regime. Together with three other students of the Governance of Migration and Diversity Master of the Erasmus University Rotterdam, we wanted to create something to help understand what's actually going on at the Greek-Turkish border and on the Greek island. How this could be explained and not unimportantly where this European approach to migration and asylum is going in the future. And I'm not going to do this alone, of course. And I've invited three wonderful speakers who are going to help me do this by looking each at their specific area. So for the first uh, perspective, which is going to be the humanitarian perspective, we have here Dorothea. Hello. Hi. Uh, Thea is a professor of humanitarian aid at the International Institute of Social Studies. And uh, she focuses on aid society relations because humanitarian aid is never just given alone without the context. And she's also done uh, research on the Greek island of Lesbos. Then for the second perspective, we will focus on the political aspect. And for this, I'm happy to welcome Zeynep Kashle. She also works at the International Institute of Social Studies and she's an assistant professor of migration and development. Her focus area is on the Middle East and Europe and she focuses on border and citizenship regimes. And then for the third perspective, uh, which is the legal perspective, we have Sahar Shirzad. And she's sitting right over there in the background, and that is because of the corona rules, and we cannot have more than three people on the table. But don't worry, she's going to join me here at the table later, and there's going to be some changes, but it's all going to be fine. So Sahar is a legal expert, and she specializes in the implementation of human rights in European law. So thank you so much for joining us. us here today. I'm very excited and let's just start with the first perspective. So Thea, you have done research in Lesbos yourself. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've seen there? Yes, I've uh, amongst others visited Moria camp and it's very shocking. You just told everybody that I, you know, I do my research all over the world, but if you come to Moria camp you think, oh I've never seen something like this. It is so fully packed that people live more or less in cages on top of each other, like their dogs or something. And then there's so little space for the tents and there's not even place for a container to do some education for the children. So it's a really depressing place to be. Yeah, that sounds like it indeed. So um, why do you think that it's such a depressing place? Like why is this humanitarian aid not working? Well, the whole point is, I think if you walk there, what you really think, the only reason why we do this, because this cannot be by accident, this must be deliberate, it must be some way of deterrence. So what do you mean by deterrence? Well, what I mean by deterrence is that the camp is actually maintained as it is to scare off other people to try. And you really get a feeling that Europe tells people who want to come to Europe, look, if you try to cross the Mediterranean, first you're at risk to die, to drown and even if you can make it look what are the conditions where you will be living so you better don't come. So it's actually the camps are actually functioning like a warning card you mean? Exactly yeah. they use living people mm -hmm. to scare off people to come to Europe. So what is this uh, this kind of policy or strategy actually what effect does that have on humanitarian aid then? Well, it's terrible because the humanitarians who work in a the camp, they have to give services, that's what they're there for. But at the same time, they also realize that it's actually a deterrence machine. So even though they don't want to be part of it, they are. They are part of the deterrence machine that keeps this system in place. And that feels really bad for humanitarians. Yeah. And of course, the resources are so terrible there that the worst is they cannot properly help people. Somebody was telling me, like, I treat somebody in the clinic, 
-hmm. But what's the point? Because after my treatment, they just have to go back to that horrible place where they will get sick again. Yeah. So it feels like an endless uh, morass for the yeah. humanitarians who work there. So what you're saying, it's actually kind of a dilemma in which humanitarian workers are. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering that with this global pandemic and with COVID, does that, have, uh, does that add extra to how humanitarians do their work? Yeah, of course. I mean, COVID-19 is adding an extra layer of misery, you might say. And first it didn't reach the camp. So I thought, oh, maybe that's at least a bit of an advantage that it's sort of closed off. But then it entered. Already 240 cases. How do you keep people apart, one and a half meter, in these kind of situations? But also, the volunteers cannot reach the islands. So people who even want to go and register as a volunteer to help, they cannot reach there anymore. And what I really find very sad is that Europe is now so focusing on COVID-19, which I also understand, but it makes us very self-centered. So who is still thinking about Moria? Who is really thinking about those, those people who are sitting there day after day after day? Yeah, and it's really important to keep continuing to know that they are there indeed. Mm -hmm. And how does a humanitarian worker actually deal with these kind of things? Because to me, it sounds incredibly overwhelming. It is. And um, I went to there to talk to some of the humanitarians and what they tell us is first that they do get depressed and they do have all these levels of anxiety to work there. Somebody was telling me it's worse to be here than in Yemen where there's a war, at least there you know what's going on. But here is Europe, the yeah. Greek government responsible it's a normal state and it doesn't do it so that's very depressing yeah and what i see people do is sort of focus on today and who you can help so if today you can help five people you help those five people tomorrow you help another 10 you help those 10 and they just try not to think too much about that bigger picture with all the politics involved because they can't do much about it anyway it will only depress them yeah yeah it sounds really like yeah. that's the only way to just keep going on. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you mentioned this political aspect because that actually brings us to the second perspective, mm -hmm. which is the political one. So for this we have Zeynep, who's sitting right here next to me. So do you agree with what Thea says, that politics is also a big part of the problem of what is actually happening right now? Yes, I certainly agree uh, with Thea on this. And to start off with politics, uh, we know that there's already a lot of conflict between Greece and Turkey. But since last decade, let's say, they are cooperating also against uh, unauthorized migration. And the latest phase of this is the EU-Turkey deal. Uh, which came into force in March 2016. Um, and uh, this was in response to the uh, refugee crisis from Europe's perspe perspective. Yeah. And this deal, it actually is an agreement on kind of an exchange between people who arrive irregular and sending people back, and it's quite complicated. But uh, this deal actually has quite a big effect on the situation on the islands, right? Exactly. And the reason is because uh, together with the deal, uh, some places like Greek islands are um, assigned as hotspots. Uh, this was the EU's immediate action plan um, to assist frontline member states that are facing disproportional arrivals uh, at their borders. Uh, so when uh, places like Moria uh, became hotspots uh, to act like facilitation, facility centers for new reception. They also became part of the external uh, policy in a way because uh, part of the deal between EU and Turkey was that Turkey was going to accept readmissions from the islands, not from the mainland, which yeah. then turned the islands into a place where migrants are contained. Yeah, so they were not able to leave the, camp, uh, yeah. the islands Island. indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, this has also been linked to a policy of externalization that the EU does. It's quite a complicated word, but can you maybe explain a little bit what this is? Sure. And just very briefly indeed, uh, externalization entails EU member states and leaders uh, move uh, migration and uh, international protection management to uh, outside of Europe, making it the responsibility of third countries, uh, other states basically. And uh, this goes parallel to the development of common mobility regime within Europe with Schengen and then also uh, asylum management with Dublin Convention. Right. 
we see that there is more and more and stricter control at the external borders of Europe. And Frontex, which is now recently called European Border and Coast Guard Agency, uh, it was founded in 2004, but since 2006 we see them operating at the Greek-Turkish border, um, providing assistance for land and sea operations. And um, this uh, kind of deals and mobility partnerships with third countries, they um, over the years became really part of the toolbox of EU migration and asylum management. And that is really uh, putting this whole system at risk because these are really informal uh, mechanisms, really soft yeah. law instruments, which are not legally binding for EU institutions. And then we see when a tension erupts between two countries like Greece, Turkey, for another reason like the Eastern Mediterranean conflict, we see that how fragile this whole system is actually, which puts um, my migrants at risk and turns them into leverage. Yeah, this is also what we've seen uh, earlier this year when Turkey opened the borders for refugees to go towards Greece and they got stuck at the border and they had to wait there, right? Yes, exactly. So you're actually saying that migrants and refugees are being used as political pawns. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true. So this externalization strategy is also being linked to uh, ideas of criminalizing migration. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, well, the thing is that hotspots became a place where um, people who arrive to Europe are being sorted out, whether they are deserving protection or not. Yeah. Um, so people who are considered inadmissible to the whole process itself uh, gradually become very much prone to criminalization because they are considered bogus refugees, right? They are yeah. deceiving the system or they are just economic migrants. So then every step they take, even when they are in the island, can so it's so open to be criminal to criminalization. And it's not only migrants. Uh, we see that people who show solidarity, humanitarians, as uh, I was talking earlier about, since 2015, we see people trying to reach to migrants, right? Helping them, yeah. organizing convoys or rescue operations. The latest one is the Dutch uh, flight that went to Ireland to yeah. hoping to bring people yeah, to Netherlands. The, the Hansa Halen, the Hansa right? Halen, yeah. 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 Um, but uh, we, this whole thing shows us that the fair share system is not working. Actually, it's really failing under the Dublin uh, system, regulations. Yeah. Well, so this Dublin regulation is actually a legal framework. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can now move on to the legal perspective, but thank you very much. So uh, Sahar, you uh, are going to represent the legal perspective here. Could you start off by telling a little bit about what the Dublin Convention is and how it's, what its place is in the asylum system of the EU? Yes, well, I'm not uh, going to explain the entire Dublin Treaty, no. <laughs> but what we should know is very interestingly, Zeynep said about obliging law. There is no uh, hard law, and Dublin Treaty doesn't create hard law for the member states to be responsible to take in refugees or take in migrants. Um, it is a restrictive approach. And what happens is that you have to uh, seek asylum at the first country or state that you encounter. That is fictional because we all know that when you come from a third country and you enter the European Union, you enter a shore. And that's why it's so concentrated at the hotspots or you can also say the shores. And what um, I am advocating is to make those asylum procedures offshore because concentrating them at the shore creates detention and deterrence, what Taya said, detention camps is what I called it, where the dehumanization begins of people. So if you're saying uh, to make it offshore, do you yeah. mean further in the, in the other member states of the European Union, or do you mean before arriving at the European Union? Uh, that's an ongoing legal discussion. We have to do with, um, there are several things legally going on. We need an action now. That's why there are activists such as Vakhan Sahala. Yeah. We need an action now for the people in Moria and Lesbos to be evacuated. There is a necessity for relocation, especially with a pandemic going on. Yeah. That's how you make it offshore. So you evacuate, relocate people mm -hmm. to have a, a place, a transit center as to call it, where it's a safe space for humanitarian aid, such as Taya said, to, to, um, to stop this nightmare of Moria. That's that's number one. We need action now. There's a humanitarian disaster happening. Yes. 
That's a legal obligation. Yeah. Step two is how do we make asylum procedure of European Union sustainable? Because now with the new migration pact, it's still based on restriction, deterrence, keeping the people out. Yeah. But how are we gonna uh, make it more uh, um, abiding the humanitarian, the human rights law on an international level? So maybe let's go back a little bit to kind of uh, uh, highlight a few things that are difficult or going wrong within this legal framework. Yeah. Because I really wanted to ask you about this categorization of who is a migrant and who is not. So differentiation between the the um, the migration is forced migration or voluntary migration. Yeah. Under forced migration, you can fall under the definition of a refugee if you apply for asylum and you're a ref you, you're a refuge. Um, and this is where the political discussion starts. Yeah. The European Union really is fixed on guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. So you are a, a, um, an, an economical migrant, you're a migrant. That you, and as Taya said, a lot of the flow that are, is entering, they don't come here for, for fun. Yeah. These are refugees, yeah. but they are systematically called migrants, yeah. also by the media. And the differentiation is super important on a legal level, because mm -hmm. when you fall under the refugee uh, convention, under the refugee uh, definition, you can get humanitarian aid and you have the right to, for asylum. Yeah. And all those rights are being taken uh, away by, from the people entering at the shore of, of Greece. Basically. So what you are saying with uh, this proving, so when you fall under the category of a refugee, yeah. uh, you have to prove that you are actually fleeing or you're needing in, uh, in yeah, need there, of protection. There's a definition, uh, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a refugee when mm -hmm. you prove that you have a fear for persecution. Yeah, That's the legal definition. Yeah. A fear for persecution based on your religion, based on your gender, based on uh, your sexuality. Um, and having to prove that fear for persecution is a hard process when you come from a safe country. Yeah. So if you're from a country of conflict such as Syria, your procedure goes faster and easier because uh, being from a, conf a country of conflict, you don't have a high threshold burden proof. So with that, you actually mean uh, it's less in the details to prove that you're actually free fleeing prosecution. Exactly. Because when there's already a war going on, it's easier to prove I was in the middle you of fall, this war. Yeah, you are, uh, per definition, uh, in fear of persecution yeah. for yeah. attacks occurring in your country. If not, if you fall under a safe country, there are safe country practices in the European Union, such as Afghanistan, which is almost 80% of the uh, refugees in Lesbos. Yeah. You have a high threshold and you're probably going to be sent back. So the difficult situation is now that because of this categorization between safe and unsafe countries, there's a very huge part of the people now on Lesbos, as you said, for Afghans, this is almost 80%, that are stuck there and they have to prove, uh, like, have to prove way more. Yeah, higher burden, higher burden of proof. And let me call they get things as they are. This is discrimination. This is discrimination based on your nationality and yeah. it is prohibited by international law on the refugee convention. So the regional level, the European Union, is violating the law uh, on, on, a, on an international level that is prohibiting for refugees to be uh, uh, treated differently based on their nationality. And that's exactly what's happening with the safe country practices. Yeah. The access to getting this protection, this asylum status, is unequal. Right? Yes, and, and the burden is also being carried unequal between member states, yes. So um, they are now working at European level also on creating new policies and they are now, they recently presented a new pact on migration and asylum. Uh, it hasn't been agreed on yet, but it's in the making. So can you tell a little bit about what is changing and especially on how the asylum procedures are going to be done? The only good news about the Migration Pact is that the Dublin Treaty is being reconsidered. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the rest is bad news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's not hard law. 
What we need is we need hard law, we need hard law, we need political integration. That is not happening. The member states are still in the liberty of keeping the refugees out and not taking a, 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 a fair share uh, and not burdening specific member states and yeah. also burdening the uh, the shores. Yeah. So the externalization is not stopping with the migration pact. Yeah. Greater even, they are putting the asylum procedures at the shores. So how are you having a high threshold for burden of proof because 70% comes from a safe country, going to prove your case that you have a fear for persecution within weeks? Yeah. How are they going to provide that legal aid? And they are still keeping the people in dehumanizing conditions. Yeah. So this, a solution for who? Yeah. So it's actually only adding to this unequal access to yeah. this procedure. And they're asking money from member states to sponsor people to return back to the country. So it's based again on restrictive deterrence, sending people back. That's what the Migration Pact is. Yeah, because that is what I uh, wanted to mention as well, that they are actually now with this Migration Pact, instead of choosing for one harmonized way of policy making, yeah. they're giving different options. Like you can choose to either do this or this or this, and, right? And they call it solidarity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the new pact on migration and asylum actually has the potential to do more harm than good right now. Yeah. yeah. Unfair trials. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Sahar, very much. This was a lot of information, yeah. and I think we have a lot of things to think about after this. Um, so before we're going to continue to the second part of this talk show, where I'm going to give all the speakers a chance to talk with each other, uh, I want to show a video that was made by Anna Farrow. Anna Farrow uh, has been a coordinator of many NGOs on the Greek mainland and has also worked on Lesbos. And we've asked her to make a short video to talk about her experiences as a practitioner in the field. Um, she will be talking and she's showing some clips and these clips are made in the new camp that was created after the fires in Moria. A Syrian named Abdul in Saloniki once told me, asylum in Greece is like walking across a field of landmines. The question is how not to die along the way. I have used this quote because it most accurately captures the many problems that people face when seeking asylum in Greece. One of the main problems is the malfunctioning of EU and international law. The Greek refugee camps that I have worked in are often overcrowded, are ill-equipped, have little resources and lack access to basic social health care, legal aid and educative services. This was most visible in the former Moria camp, where the quality of hygiene and safe living conditions was so incredibly low that it was a continuous health hazard. People who have fled their own countries have to remain in survival mode simply because their basic human needs and human rights are not met. Try helping people with serious health issues and trauma. People cannot heal when they are not safe. Meanwhile, the minefield is becoming increasingly more dangerous. What we've seen over the years is a loss of morals within the EU and a further collapse of the rule of law in Greece. The new EU migration pact is not an asylum policy. It is a fortress Europe policy. It puts borders and returns before asylum. I think I speak on behalf of many when I say that the migration pact needs to be rewritten. A true asylum policy allows people to express their wish for asylum, for them to be received in safe and dignified reception facilities, and for their asylum procedures to be handled by qualified people and them to have access to free legal aid, and if indeed people do not need international protection, that they are returned in safety, with respect for the non refoulement principle, with respect for procedural rights, and with respect for the law. The EU should shift their focus to capacity building and development within Greece by focusing on creating employment and equipping Greece with the knowledge and human resources to ensure a functioning legal aid system. More focus should be put on relocation to other EU countries and on integration strategies that include the Greek local communities within the solution. Refugee camps like Moria should not be normalised and people currently living in tents on Lesbos should not be permitted. Structural violation of human rights should not be the norm and pragmatism should not be chosen to enforce an institutionalised system of deterrence. This is Europe. Greece is the birthplace of democracy.
the EU has an acquis where human rights stand central, and we signed the Refugee Convention. We Europeans need to respect that signature. It is adopted in the directives, it is written in EU legislation, it is written in Greek law, so let's live up to it. Well, I think that this video has given us a lot to talk about and uh, I want to start off with a small question. So, looking more at the future, if you would be in charge of changing this migration and asylum policy, what would you change? And mostly, what would you change for if your first choice? <laughs> so, uh, maybe let's start with Zeynep. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think the presentations before what Sahar already said and also Anna's uh, talk tells us that uh, the first thing that needs to change is really the Dublin uh, Convention, how it is um, built up with the whole system of deterrence, right, in the background. Uh, that requires a mentality shift, maybe, to, for equal responsibility sharing. And instead of pushing for return and detention and deportation, more looking at it from how we can actually make it easier for people to reach their country of um, asylum and uh, allow people to give people this chance to actually seek asylum in the country that they want to reach. Hmm. Yes, um, and actually we also, and you see in the images in the, uh, in the fragment, is that there's a reality we have to deal with right now, which is Moria. So the, again, the number one action that we need is to create a safe place for the relocation of the reality we're dealing with. That is one, the group and the individuals one by one who need a fair trial and who need a safe space to be helped by possibly NGOs and governments of member states. So what we should do is to legally make it possible to have a positive spin on the externalization that you talk about. This entire externalization of uh, temporarily being in a center before entering your asylum procedure in a different member state can be safe because there are a lot of empty buildings, especially with the pandemic right now, all over Europe. Mm. Taya, don't you think that... Uh, no, I the, totally yeah. agree. I mean, it starts with when people come to Europe, we have to extend hospitality. some hospitality yeah. and make sure that people can feel safe wherever they are, waiting for their fair procedure. Yeah. And uh, what I could add as well, what I would really love to see as a first step, that we stop lying. <laughs> and there are so many lies about. I mean, it is as if the media, politicians keep telling us first that the migrants who come to Greece are not refugees, but migrants. Mm -hmm. And most of them are just fortune seekers, which is definitely not the case. If you look at the numbers of how many of people in Greece are actually fleeing from a war situation, heavily traumatized, Secondly, I think our politicians also lie about the fact that there may not be a support base left for refugees. It's as if they are competing who is the toughest, who is the toughest to speak. Yes. But if you look at the statistics, there's a majority of people like you and me in Europe, it's the majority who says, no, let's help those refugees. I don't want to be criminalized if I help a migrant or a refugee. Definitely. And we have things to do. I mean, there are cities that say, let's let, let have refugees come to our city. There are people say, who say we can have a refugee in the house, but we're not allowed by our governments who just keep lying that there is no support base. So that's what I would love to see change. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yeah, and it's maybe also related to how the whole system in these uh, uh, hotspots, especially now pushing the bureaucrats who are uh, supposed to decide on who is admissible, who is not, pushes them to tick a box so mm -hmm. quickly and assume that there's only one reason why people migrate, but even then the right reason that they say they are uh, coming here to seek a refuge, right? And it's just, this system just creates more bureaucratization and uh, makes it even harder for people to really, um, really voice the reason why they flee and where, where they mm -hmm. flee. I think, from. yes, and... Uh, um after having dealt with the reality that we are facing right now, where deterrence is happening in those camps, we should also end the deadly sea route. Because, because of the failure of our asylum system, there's still a deadly route that people keep on taking to flee their countries. And maybe externalization could be a solution within the third countries themselves, for example, by cooperating with these third countries. 
What is European Union, for example, has done now is pay millions to Afghanistan to take their people back because they don't want, the European Union doesn't want to take the refugees. Instead of paying countries off, try to find a system. And this is a pilot also a lot of scholars have been working on, and it could work in cooperation with UNHCR, a global responsibility that we can take is talk to these countries such as Afghanistan, such as Syria, to find a safe space within those countries themselves to start the application there without having to go through the entire route and being traumatized and entering European tra Union traumatized. So we should take these externalizations and work it in our benefit uh, if I may yeah. react to this, in this that, that is, for example, what has been done for years in Turkey. Yeah. There are a lot of people waiting to resettle from Turkey to third countries, because even though Turkey signed the UN Convention, there is a geographical limitation. So anyone who's coming from the East cannot be a refugee in Turkey, but wait for years and years for resettlement. So what this shows us, actually, that it's really about political commitment. Mm -hmm. You can set uh, all kinds of rules and regulations very well, but then as long as there is no um, political will to make these processes faster, right? Because we see for the um, responsibility sharing, there are EU countries who are not cooperative, but there are those who are cooperative, but so slow in processing their um, relocation um, processes. Then people still wait in the islands, even though we, we are talking about a cooperative mm -hmm. EU member state. Yeah. So there's really, what we need is a real mentality shift here, based on the human rights uh, conventions that EU member states are all in the end bind with. No, I agree. I totally agree. And what I think I, I, I hear all of us say that what we should have is a system that is safe and human, that doesn't force people to cross a sea in the most dangerous way, that doesn't leave people for years in a camp to rot, basically, but have a safe and human system and most of all to see everybody as an individual yes. and not say, okay, you're from Afghanistan, you don't count. You're from Syria, you may count. But listen to the stories of each and every individual. And that's what we agreed in the law, isn't it? That every single person has the right to an individual procedure, being heard, having legal assistance, and being taken on board and being listened to. Mm -hmm. And then maybe not everybody can stay, but at least they have a fair fair procedure, isn't it? Yes, yeah. and humans are being, and this is where my activistic side comes up, but humans are being treated as products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it as a product, I'm a former refugee, I'm a successful product. I cost less money when I got my Dutch citizenship in 1998, and I'm highly educated right now, integrated in the Netherlands. And human lives those years that are wasted, seven to ten years, a decade in those centers, those people cannot get those years back. Mm -hmm. Human lives, and this is a message for the right-winged policymakers, is never a bad investment. So if you even look at it, so no, human lives is never a bad investment mm -hmm. politically. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I think this is a very telling statement to end our talk show today because it is about a mentality shift and it's also about the political will. And it is the fact that who is in the driving seat of this political uh, landscape is us. So as long as we're trying to uh, stay focused on what is actually going on and letting our voices heard, we can really try and make a change. And this is actually where I wanted to come back just quickly to our title, which is Europe's Achilles heel, because we really feel that within European policy, this is such a vulnerable and weak spot that's really going to make or break the future of the EU. And with that, I wanted to end this talk show. And first of all, thank you so much to all the speakers, to Thea, to Sahar, to Zeynep, to your wonderful contributions. Then secondly, I would like to thank the LDE Center of Governance of Migration and Diversity and the Inst International Institute of Social Studies for making this possible. I want to thank the audience for watching. And then last but not least, I want to thank my colleagues, Elina Jonitz, Ingrid Blankenstein and René Edhardt. And then of course, myself, Jana Hilhorst, for organizing this all. Thank you. <laughs>